Hello, and welcome to part four of Web Scraping with Python. This is a four-part introductory tutorial in which you'll use web scraping to build a data set from a New York Times article about President Trump. If you'd like to follow along at home, you can download this Jupyter Notebook from GitHub, and there's a link to it in the description below. In the first three parts of this tutorial, we built a structured data set from the New York Times article using Python's beautiful soup library. In this video, we'll apply a tabular data structure to our data set and then export it to a CSV file. At the end, I'll wrap up with some web scraping advice and resources. The last major step in our process is to apply a tabular data structure to our existing structure, which is our list of tuples, which you can see here. We're going to do this using the pandas library, an incredibly popular Python library for data analysis and manipulation. If you don't have it, you can search online for the pandas installation instructions. The primary data structure in Pandas is the data frame, which is suitable for tabular data with columns of different types, similar to an Excel spreadsheet or a SQL table. We can convert our list of tuples into a data frame by passing it to the data frame constructor and specifying the desired column names. The data frame includes a head method, which allows you to examine the top of the data frame. The numbers on the left side of the data frame are known as the index, which act as identifiers for the rows. Because we didn't specify an index, it was automatically assigned as the integers 0 to 115. We can examine the bottom of the data frame using the tail method. Did you notice that January was abbreviated, but July was not? It's best to format your data consistently, and so we're going to convert the date column to Pandas special date time format. This code converts the date column to date time format and then overwrites the existing date column. Notice that we did not have to tell pandas that the column was originally in month, day, year format. Pandas just figured it out. Let's take a look at the results. Here's the head. Notice the change to the date column. And here's the tail. Not only is the date column now consistently formatted, but pandas also provides a wealth of date-related functionality because it's in date time format. Finally, we'll use pandas to export the data frame to a CSV file or comma separated value file which is the simplest and most common way to store tabular data in a text file. We set the index parameter to false to tell pandas that we don't need it to include the index, the integers 0 to 115, in the CSV file. You should be able to find this file in your working directory and open it in any text editor or spreadsheet program. In the future, you can rebuild this data frame by reading the CSV file back into pandas. And there you go. If you want to learn a lot more about the pandas library, you can watch my video series, Easier Data Analysis in Python with Pandas, 
or check out my top eight resources for learning data analysis with pandas. This is all at my website, dataschool.io. To summarize, here are the 16 lines of code that we use to scrape the web page, extract the relevant data, convert it into a tabular data set, and export it to a CSV file. Here is where we read the web page. Here's where we parsed the HTML and then extracted those 116 records. Here's where we extracted the date, lie, explanation, and URL from each record. And then finally, here's where we uh, created a data frame in order to give it a tabular data structure, converted the date column to a date time format, and then exported it to a CSV file. Okay. Briefly, I want to go through some advice for web scraping. First, web scraping works best with static, well-structured web pages. Dynamic or interactive content on a web page is often not accessible through the HTML source, which makes scraping it much harder. Second, web scraping is a fragile approach for building a data set. The HTML on a page you are scraping can change at any time, which may cause your scraper to stop working. Third, if you can download the data you need from a website, or if the website provides an API with data access, those approaches are preferable to scraping since they are easier to implement and less likely to break. Fourth, if you're scraping a lot of pages from the same website in rapid succession, it's best to insert delays in your code so that you don't overwhelm the website with requests. If the website decides you're causing a problem, they can block your IP address, which may affect everyone in your building. And finally, before scraping a website, you should review its robots.txt file, also known as the robots exclusion standard, to check whether you are allowed to scrape their website. Here's the robots.txt file for the New York Times. Explaining how to read this is uh, slightly beyond the scope of this tutorial, but you can read online about how to read a robots.txt file. Next, I have some recommended web scraping resources for you. I'm not going to read each of these out. If you want to uh, click through to these links, you should download this Jupyter Notebook from the link I have shown on the screen, github.com slash justmarkham slash trump dash lies. Or there's a link to the notebook in the description below this video. Finally, it's worth noting that Beautiful Soup actually offers multiple ways to express the same command. I tend to use the most verbose option, since I think it makes the code readable, but it's useful to be able to recognize the alternative syntax since you might see it used elsewhere. Here's an example. Uh, we can search for a tag by name by saying first result dot find and pass strong to it. Alternatively, you can search for a strong tag by accessing it like an attribute. So these are identical. You can also search for multiple tags a few different ways. So you might remember we use the find all method on the soup object to find the span tags where the class attribute had a value of short desk. So this is how I wrote the code. But if you don't specify a method, for example, if you don't specify find all, it's assumed to be find all. So this code is identical to that. And even shorter, you can specify the attribute as if it's a parameter. You can say class underscore equals short desk. 
Now, why you have to put an underscore here is beyond the scope of this tutorial. You can read through it in the beautiful soup documentation if you like. I always recommend the most verbose options because again, I think it makes the code most readable. Okay, that is it for this video series. I hope you learned a lot. Please do check out my other videos on YouTube about pandas, machine learning with scikit-learn, version control with Git, and other topics. You can subscribe to my channel if you'd like to be notified about my future videos. Thank you again for joining me, and I hope to see you again soon.